Dr. Shaheen Etminan, welcome aboard. Gordon, thanks for having me today. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Now, what I typically do in the, my new podcast era this year is I ask ChatGPT for a biography of my clients. But in your case, particularly, like, a lot of the cool stuff you've been doing is after their 2021 cutoff. Absolutely. So I'm going to attempt a biography of you, Jean, and how it works is I'm going to tell everyone what I know about you and then you correct me and add parts. And, and that's how, that's how we introduce you uh, on the yeah, show. Yeah. I watched so the begin. episode with Mark as well. So that would be. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Chad T did him pretty good. Uh, sometimes it gets people. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it gets people quite wrong, which is funny actually. Uh, then people can say no. I was not born in Japan. I was born in <laughs> Birmingham. It's quite good. Yes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> born in Iran and raised in Canada, Dr. Shaheen Etminan is a chemical engineer, business owner, investor, ethnopharmacological researcher, and co-originator of a line of nootropics based on the ancient medicines of pre-Zoroastrian and Zoroastrian Iran, including what is, I believe, and I'm sure you do as well, the best candidate so far for the legendary and elusive substance of the gods, known as most famously Soma, but Haoma in how we're going to be having that discussion today. So how is that? I think it was uh, brief and to the point. I kind of like, I feel like I have gone through several lives and the, the most uh, recent version of me, definitely. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well. Now that we've introduced you and, and laid out where our topic is, you get the traditional first question, which is, Shaheen, were you a weird kid? Um, in some senses, yes, I was a weird kid. Um, not that weird, um, but to some level, I had my own things happening. I kind of say like it's, I had like my childhood mysticism somehow. I had this moments that I had to, I would say like at that point, it was either meditation or maybe mostly prayers, you know, that for me, uh, with the context that I was experiencing within the family was allowing me to kind of build my self-confidence and uh, for kind of encountering what's happening in the outside world. And I guess to me, whatever, whenever I look back, that's the most weird part of my childhood. All right. So. Were you praying differently to the family? Were you praying to like, where was there, was it behaviorally different or were the experiences <laughs> with retrospect, you think, okay, that was probably something. Yeah. So we never, uh, so I'm coming from a family that my dad was anti-religion. So she, from very childhood, he was trying to show that the construct of the religions are very dogmatic and kind of like even over pushing that. So like even being a little bit conservative on my childhood side and from my mom, always trying to keep it more on a milder version. But I think it, part of it to Iranians always come from this notion that Iranians are practicing as Muslims, but they are not really Muslims. They are Zoroastrian Muslims, or they are a little bit often of a different versions of Muslims, I would say. And, uh, so there are traditional, there's traditions versus religions and even prayers are the same. So we never really prayed, you know, let's say within the family or as a group, but uh, the weirdness was around the fact that I was uh, taking mostly at night, I was taking this time by myself, closing, like locking the door, going to the room and then like having this kind of like moments of prayer. I think for that age, this is about, I'm talking about when I was eight actually. And, uh, I was looking into, let's say holy book at that point, it was both, it was Quran, you know, for me. And also, you know, it was, I think it was also a Hafiz book at that point and uh, was trying to get something mystical out of that. And it's very funny because for me, just like opening this, uh, just putting an intention, opening it up. And there was these messages that some pages was little, like the text was bolder. And there's some pegs that there, there were not. So these are nothing to do with my parents, but it was mostly around, I think sure. for me, it was a 
yeah, it was kind of like something within that I was trying to build upon. And from a childhood experience, it was like for me to feel more confident the next day when I was going to school that like everything is going to open up. I was being held and protected. And I think I had that. And there's the funniest thing. I was actually sharing this with another friend yesterday was that like there, I remember there was a day that like we had friends over and their kids were playing. And within the play, I left again, closed the door. And like while all the kids are playing and then like had my little ritual and then came back and then just like, you know, resume playing with them. So I would say this was probably beside being curious. I also had a lab, I was like a chemistry lab in my closet. So I think that was mostly because my mom was a science teacher and I was doing like all kinds of experimentation. So these are the two highlights of being a weird kid. <laughs> I like that because I can construct a narrative after the fact that sums up part of the journey we're about to go on because you're in class. So there's the, the maternal influenced material exploration side, but, but that exploration drive is still there on the inner level, which is going to be the, the principal part of the discussion about where it is. The, the adventure I'm having now are uh, focused quite a bit on the interior, still built on the exterior, still built on a molecular understanding, right? So it's almost like there's a left hand, right hand component to how it is young Shaheen was making sense of the world that we can, we can draw a line to now. Yeah. Absolutely. Like reflecting Absolutely. back, these are, as I said, it's like whatever at that age is just having an inner journey is just so big, for example, for a kid. And I don't think that my family were mystical. I, th I would say like Iranians are mystical in some level, all of them, but it's kind of in a lower layer. It's not the surface, but, but it's still, yeah, I looking through like the path that I've gone in the past 41 years, that's pretty much, you know, aligned with those experiences at the very young age. Very cool. And when did you emigrate to Canada? How old? I was 21. Uh, it's about like 20 years ago, but I have a state wow, very connected cool. to Iran. So I kind of like. I would say I'm part of a generation of diaspora, of Iranian diaspora that are probably a very rare group because as my upbringing was in Iran. I went to school, I had like Persian literature. I went to learn about, let's say, all these, uh, let's say mystical paths and everything. And then after that, when I finished my undergrad, I moved to Canada to do my grad school. And since then I have been always you know, connected to the social progression and what's happening in Iran, including all whatever, you know, uh, the hardships and traumas, you know, of the past 20 years and, and before that. But I would leave that for the next yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's interesting to me. I thought I was a little bit younger. I have a friend of mine I grew up with who emigrated from Greece to Australia when he was about six or seven. And he became, mm -hmm. like, he speaks and reads ancient Greek now. Like, he... Mm -hmm. It was always very alive for him, his background growing up amongst principally, you know, white Anglo-Australians. And I wasn't sure if what your journey was like there, because you, you actually find that in diaspora communities that the, the, there is a pull to that kind of, not just, which we just described, like a contemporary Iranian identity, but the work you're doing is thousand years ago in Iran, not, <laughs> not so much like. Exactly. Um, uh, not many Iranians even know that. about this. It's interesting. I guess coming from uh, these a uh, little bit like more ancient uh, civilizations, the amount of knowledge is so much that the peoples of like contemporary people are not able to really dig into many of, you know, let's say the depths of many of them because of the amount of material, you know, that, I think, let's say in a Westerner's eye, let's say when they read Rumi or when they read Hafez, it's the gist of it. It's very just, they just integrate mm. that into their lives. But, but when you're like reading them in Farsi, you have to go through all the metaphors and unlock and like, this is, it's nice, it's beautiful, but at the same time, like let's say for a regular temporary person that doesn't really have the capability to translate all these metaphors, it's kind of like a barrier to understand that versus the translation to another language is making it much easier to understand. I like that. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. So when did you start getting into whirling and was that part of this like <laughs> diaspora process of reconnection? Or did you... Oh, no, no, no. It was, uh, so whirling for me has been, uh, thanks for asking that question. I, whirling for me has been always very, yeah, yeah. Kind of like I uh, kept it 
like to me, you know, versus just putting it out. And the reason for that is because I would say this is really an ancient, uh, you know, medication in motion versus the way that they have put it out, let's say, even from the Mivlevy order that they go in a very codified approach to whirling versus, you know, let's say they call it in Iran, they call it whirling dance, which they call it dance. It's a dance. Like they just put something nice and then they had, it has this external, you know, exposure. So to me, there's no external exposure about it. Everything is inside. There is this perimeter mm -hmm. of, you know, like the circular around you that whenever you think that. Like there is an eye from outside, you're probably doing it for a wrong reason, you know, but whenever you are within and in the boundary, then you are actually within yourself. But actually my journey with whirling started in, um, when I was exposed through my, like two of my ex-girlfriends to basically Sufi tradition. It was very interesting. There were different lineages as well. And uh, it was like the first one, it was, it came as an invitation. I always had this mystical calling, but I didn't really pursue. The second one, she was also a Sufi. And with that, I started basically getting into Zekir and like, and Zekir is, is exactly like mantras and axes of meditation. And then it was back in 2000, actually 17, it's not many years ago, it was about six years ago that I traveled to Konya, which is basically the shrine of, of Mevlana. And and there I was very curious. I had no intention to get into whirling. I probably had just turned once before in Berkeley with, with a suit, basically with the dervish community in Berkeley, which is also a big, big, big community. And, um, and when I was in Konya, this is during that December 10th to December 17th, which is the whirling dervish festival. That's like all the dervishes from all the lineages come to Konya. And then this, the, the December 17th is called the, the night of a wedding. What they call it the Ors or the, uh, the um, or the Arus, which in Farsi means uh, the bride. Uh, that's the night that they are saying that the soul of the Mevlana actually just like went into the wedding with the God, and um, and like it, and there is this whole city just meditating and whirling. And I was there in 2017, and I actually like through somebody I was initiated, and I started turning, and I started turning. And I was just right there. I never practiced and I never thought that I have to just like put my feet like that or the other. And, and I felt that, okay, this is a practice that, you know, I was called into and I, it's very natural. My body goes very naturally into this trance state and it's, it's equilibrium. And since then I have been practicing, um, very regularly. I'm actually also looking into it as uh, just that scientific side of me, I have been working on basically unlocking the neurophysiology of whirling as well. So that means that I have collected a lot of uh, biomarker data, which is brainwave, heart rate, uh, on whirling that I'm actually like soon is going to be you know, published in a paper as well as a website that I'm looking into basically the science of whirling as a meditation. Wow. So how long is a whirling session on average then? So whirling session is as a practice, you can turn and turn, you know, for, for how long you're comfortable with. I would say the, um, the average, you know, uh, there was a, a Rumi festival in, um, in Seattle back in 2000, I think it was 19 or 18 that I participated and it was like a 24 hour whirling, but it's not, it was not like 24 hour. Everybody it was 24 hour for holding this space. So I think probably there I had turned for, let's say, I don't know, let's say 25 minutes to about 45 minutes, just non-stop. And, uh, but you know, like it's not something that you really feel tired of. You just have to keep that state of mind and you can turn and turn. Uh, but usually when I practice, it's something between, let's say 15 minutes to about, um, yeah, like, like less than 20 minutes. Okay, cool. And so. Because actually, one of the first guests I ever had on the show before it was really a podcast was another psychonaut. And he was, we were talking about the human propensity to alter states of consciousness. And his example was his watching his two kids growing up and how kids will just spin around until they fall down and realize that there's, there's an alteration going on there. In your case, in the case of well, I'm not... Whirling is more than that, right? But there, there's like a, there's a biological drive that is kind of interesting there that like kids will naturally find their way into 
an alteration that points inward, right? The, the, the experience and the joy of themselves, which I think in your journey, as I look at it from the outside, it's interesting to me, given where the Ancestral Magi project has ended up that you found and had, did you find whirling prior to your first psychedelic experience? Like did, does, does it go in that sequence or did you do psychedelics well, then the, whirling and more, actually more these mine. are? Yeah, I would say, um, I would say that, yeah, this is 2016, seven, I think it was, they all came around the same time. I was living in San Francisco at the same time. My first ayahuasca experience was in California. It was a California version of it. And, um, uh, so it was kind of around the same time, but I guess that calling that year for me, specifically, I remember that was the, the year that I took, a, you know, uh, basically a leap of faith to leave the corporate job, you know, and just like get into become a full, uh, full-time entrepreneur as I have been the past six years. And I guess that was a lot of soul searching and that they came around the same time for me, but, um, but in terms of the effect, I would say, um, yeah, I have done so psychedelics. I've tried the I've been, um, mushroom, psilocybin, uh, ketamine, MDMA, if it's counted also as, uh, as, as a psychedelic and also a lot of beta carbons that what we are working on. And there are psychedelics that I haven't tried, but I would say I never, I have had this feeling that like I, my consciousness is being like, kind of like dissociated like these are the biggest you know like the, the altered states that you really feel that this is an altered state of consciousness because when you think you know very let's say on a very high flush of thought and you're processing um when you see that like images are moving they are also like altered state but i think the, in the altered in the alteredness then there are degrees and there are different channels that you yeah. tap into uh, with, with whirling is the same, you know, with whirling, when you're turning, you know, with the open eye, you know, like the images that you see, then all of a sudden, specifically when you just go and when you chant and when you go faster, you like, it, it's just the whole continuum that comes toward you. It's just one space. It's a one space that you're in. And, um, um, but yeah, I would say, I can't really say that this was more, um, powerful than the other one. I have been, I have been approaching all of them in a very careful, you know, and step-by-step -step way, I would say. Gotcha. So the kid who was obviously interested in mystical experiences and had some kind of mystical frame also became a chemical engineer and then went and sat with ayahuasca. How do you frame that experience? Was it, did you, uh, did you look at it principally from the point of view of, which is a, a a level I don't have a, a much time for is that like molecular activity level. Did you look at it more like, okay, yeah. I can describe it this way, but it's like, there's a, it's part of a bigger cosmovision. This is telling me something about consciousness in the universe. So what was it like after your first psychedelic experience when you have this uh, mystic interest, but you all live? Yeah, I would say science has always been a, um, you know, a tool for me, you know, to understand things better just as a tool, let's say. And, um, and specifically like, uh, getting into chemical engineering from the beginning, it was, I think at being born and raised in Iran at some level, there are some intricacies about like being raised in Iran, going to an undergrad in Iran is uh, that, um, that you don't have much chance to really choose It's a little bit like probably might be weird from an, an, an outsider, but there's this big exam that everybody just participate and then like it's pick and choose, you know, but when I came to Canada specifically, I am more a person of, um, yeah, I have to observe. I like everything that I've done. If you should look into some of my papers, there have been always just this measurements in a, in a medium of like the physical medium that they, they were all experimental. So experimentation has always been part of me. And I am, yeah, I take a lot of risk into experimentation, specifically, let's say some of the, when you do a PhD thesis with experimentation, like everybody know that this may take very long time. But um, I would say when I started chemical engineering, I had no vision where I was going. And my second year of my PhD, I knew that I have nothing to do with that industry, which at that point was like the energy industry. And, um, and, um, 
But at the same time, you know, I was receiving a lot of scholarships, you know, from the university. I was one of the best students. And um, that was the point that I started to do a lot of uh, social entrepreneurship. I started my entrepreneurship journey as a social entrepreneur. Uh, but at the same time, um, I kept myself within the realm of fundamental physics. So it's, it, I, it was a chemical engineering, but if you look into my works, they're most, mostly physics. Uh, and they're physics and transport phenomenon physics, which is basically looking into different mediums in the nature and then the flow that happens through the potential difference. And with that, I guess that gives me, that gave me this, um, this perspective about everything, you know, in the nature, that everything is a phenomenon that you can find the, the analogous, you know, processes in elsewhere and then understand it better. You know, like in physics, everything is tangible, but then when you go beyond physics, like say the, the next is energy, you don't, the energy is not tangible. You may feel that say the temperature, but, but I guess now that I'm going through the understanding of world from the lens of like say Shahin today, what is really fascinating for me is the medium of thoughts and consciousness and then the flow that you goes through one way and to, to the other. And that flow is actually the knowledge that we receive through intuition. And then how you can set this, it is kind of medium up in a way that you are exposed to a potential difference of knowledge for that to flow toward you is what that, what that language of science is helping me to unlock uh, the realm of um, mis the mystic realm better. It's very well explained. I'm sure I'm not the first person who's asked you that, or you've had to sit with like, how do I, it's almost like, how do I sequence my thinking? It's like, I, I begin with consciousness and, and intuitive inspiration and, and it ends like, and then the next part is the scientific component rather than scientific component. Does that make sense? Like it's, um, you, you live in a very different reality depending on how you sequence those capacities. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I guess from one point of view that when you have the tool of science, um, it allows basically it always keep you cautious about using the language that is not the right language. And for something that we don't know, and we, it's like, like exactly like that elephant that you touch different part of it, like it's very natural and normal that like, let's say people are using different languages, like the new age language that like, I feel this energy, I feel your energy, you know, like. And some people, they call it woo-woo, but I, I guess that, that that tool has helped me to realize that like there are things that I can explain scientifically, but there is a lot of things that they're scientific, but we don't just have the tools to measure and, and explain it. So um, I can say that like I have written my best paper, which is probably the highest cited paper based on basically an imagination based on the kind of like dreaming. And, um, and that was like, that was to me, one of the signs that like, you really have to allow yourself to, um, to come out of the, um, this kind of like, maybe I would say, um, this truck, this structure of science, let's say, to be able to bring other things and then like use that language to at least to explain as much as you can rather than just calling it non-scientific or, you know, pseudoscience and then just like put it aside. Yeah, nice one. All right. So I want to get the sequence when we move into the Halma and Zoroastrianism and so on. Presumably the kid who was doing self-directed reading of the Quran and Hafez and whatever was aware vaguely of, you know, who the Zoroastrians were, who Zoroaster was, and consequently that there was this uh, substance that the, the priests had access to. Like, so I'm trying to get in my head the sequence of, did you know about this and have a short list of what those, what the candidate components of Halma may have been prior to ayahuasca or other psychedelics? Or was it more like, okay, cool. So yeah. I've just had this psychedelic experience. My own tradition has stories of, of psychedelia, of, of entheogens. And I wonder, like, talk us through the sequence of how you got to where you are now. Exactly. That was the latter one. Like, that was, for me, it was basically getting into, uh, like, I started just basically using these, all, like, 
um, I would say like mind altering substances very late in my, um, in my, let's say late thirties, I would say. And I was not like a, I don't know, teenager who took LSD, you know, when I was very young. So uh, yeah, I, uh, it was, it came through exposure to ayahuasca, to psilocybin. And then I started to dig into, I realized that, okay, this is something that probably any tradition has had, you know, and, um, let me just look into see what I would find, you know, in the Iranian tradition. And then I started to look into some of the, like the work of different scholars, you know, that existed and, and then, and then there's a lot of knowledge that doesn't exist, you know, you don't have access to and. And, and then look for those. And then you see that when there is, when there is a silence somewhere, you know, that there is a reason for that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I guess, uh, that was, that was, that was very late. I, I started in 2000, this company that I started in 2019, it started around basically bringing my chemical engineering skills into building an extraction machine. So it started with basically just a knowledge of extraction and then. With extraction, I started to work with different plants. I started with cannabis first, and then from cannabis, that was the, like the kind of like the beginning of the psychedelic renaissance. And then I moved quickly into like looking, working with psilocybin mushrooms. And then working with, specifically with mushroom, I realized that there are like mushrooms, there, you're working with small molecules that are called alkaloids. that are very deep into the plant. And then from there, you realize that, okay, there are, if, there are so many psychoactives around the world in different plants. And then I looked into basically just looking back into the tradition. And um, it's interesting that like in our literature, you know, there is a lot of referrals to, for example, we call like in Hafez and Rumi, for example, in many areas and many other mystics and poets they had, they're referring to this water of life. You know, let's say there are something that you drink and, you know, but the, what they call the Abe Hayat, or for example, uh, you know, it, there are you know, it, many other referrals like that, but they're all metaphorical. Like you always think that this, this, this is something that, you know, just like relating to your connection to the higher realm or the realm of divine. But, but those referrals, if you look back specifically, you see that many of them are actually has, has had a like a real referral to something. Um, but maybe over time, because that's been obscured or yeah, somehow been deleted, then like has come to the, you know, to, to more on, of a metaphoric expression. Um, this is kind of, um, I think there, there has been especially with Sufi tradition, because like the Islam, um, you know, the Shia is kind of a tweak, uh, a tweak of, you know, Islam that came actually in, in Iran, like during Safavi time, right? And, and, and they also were exposed to, there were referrals, there's a lot of referrals, for example, for exposure to, you know, hashish or cannabis during that time. But, uh, but that is very different. You don't, that's, that's something that I have to still dig into to see like, how was the, uh, let's say use case or where they were taking it. Let's say there are people in, in Pakistan still, like they're in Iran, you know, that they're doing these um, kind of um, gatherings that are, you know, like they are somehow um, exposed to some level of hashish or cannabis. But, but what we're talking about is very old. Like if you talk to even Zoroastrians, they don't know about this. This is before Zoroastrians. This is pre-Zoroastrians. So Magi were pre-Zoroastrian uh, priests, you know, and then basically Mogus, which we call it Mok, uh, Mok in Farsi is basically the priest of Zoroastrian, uh, religion or pre of, but the priest of pre Zoroastrian religion, even. And the Magi is actually the, the plural of Mogus, which we call Mok or Mogus is basically a single word. And then Magi is basically the Magi were the priest who helped or who actually followed Zarathustra's teachings and helped him to actually spread his teachings to more people. Uh, that's, that's, that, that yeah. this word actually has come in, in Gotha, which is the exact word of Zarathustra. Gotha is the, uh, kind of like the older version of, uh, uh, of Avesta, which is the holy book of Zoroastrians that are related directly to, to Zarathustra. 
And okay, um, this is like probably important because I will, I watched it yesterday. I'll link up the um, presentation on the Vicenna YouTube channel that you gave about pre-Zoroastrianism and ancient Zoroastrianism and so on. But if we're after this substance, this is quite important, isn't it? So let's talk about the sequence, as you say, the, what is the cosmology of the, the Magi? Like what's the time period we're looking? Uh, because the substance emerges, they, they had a substance, <laughs> that, had substance that they would drink. I would, let, let's say uh, like, in, like let's look into before the Iranians and Indians kind of like spread to different lands. So this is where, you know, the Indo-European come to kind of like the north of Iran. They come a little bit down. That's where they called Aryans. And then, then they are Indo-Iranians. And then the Indo, the, in the Indo-Iranians, Homo Somo is still the same thing. So it's just a the pronunciation is different. Like they call it like Hindu Sindhu, you know, they, they, they pronounce, I'm not sure how they pronounce it differently in Iran that the, 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 the you know, this, they just basically translated to the, basically the pronunciation changed to be, you know, as he, but, um, but that was the time that pre, there were priests, there were priests, they were cattle runners. Like they were, like they had this job of being a priest who were just like working with a small group of, you know, cattle runners, you know, that, that was the communities. And then, then they started just to go down on these lands, you know, let's say part of them, they went mostly to, toward India, northwest of India. And then the other part came to the northeast of Iran, where Khorasan, and then like north of Afghanistan, today's Afghanistan is. And, um, that is where the Zora Zarahusra is actually uh, also from. And then. Um, and then the, the, then the Sanskrit language kind of like that's where the Sanskrit also gets separated from the old Avestan language. So these are the very two different type of people and the Sanskrit and Somo has been there for, let's say, this is like about 2,500 years, uh, BC. And then, and then let's say between 2,500 years to about, let's say 1700, this is the time that there has been the shamanic practices that. And all the teachings, they were just um, oral. So they were just, all the teachings, they were just this linguistic technology that they were using, you know, by chanting. And they were just transferring that to the next generation and next generation. So um, one of the distinctions between uh, Avesta, basically between Avesta or Gatha and uh, Rig Veda is that uh, Avesta or Gatha was transcribed um, about a thousand years before after it was a thousand years after uh Rig Veda. And that is why, you know, uh, like some scholars um that have worked specifically on Homo Soma, they believe that the referrals to the definition of uh Homo was more valid in in um okay. you know let's say in the later referrals because they were more accurate and more recent. And uh, that is kind of making the old Avestan language and then Gatha and then, and then Avesta basically. But, uh, when you look into Rig Veda, like the referral to Soma is, is there are so many things that are introduced as Homa. Homa is a God, Homa is a deity, Homa is also, you know, something that they drink and, uh, this just, they give them this, um, you know, this immortality, the sense of immortality. And, um, but when you come to the Zoroastrian, Pantheon, Homo has a very different, the Homo is a potion. Homo is something that they drank. There is no, there's, there's no, um, referral to that as a deity in, in, in the, uh, Zoroastrian Pantheon. And, um, so that is kind of where I would say, you know, these two were separated and the timeline in terms of the time, like about 2,500 yeah. to about 17, you know, to around 1400 BC. And what interests me about this, because I'm, I'm super interested in Eurasia 10,000 BC, for instance, is what we have at 2,500 BC is the first textual evidence uh, historians can use to say, okay, cool. We have evidence that they're talking about this here in the sense of we can backcast from the writing to basically guess. <laughs> that they're, they're transmitting this information on a uh, oral basis, but what was happening at 2501 BC? Like we actually, w when it comes to a little bit earlier or even a lot older than that, why I think the difference between say Homer and, and Soma, when you look at the Rig Veda and you look at Zoroastrianism is important is we can demonstrate 
and this is a really problematic term, but go with me on this. We can demonstrate a complexification out of an initial shamanic cosmology where if you think about ayahuasca in its traditional context, she, and this is how I experience her anyway, like she is a her, she is grandmother of ayahuasca. So she's a collection of plant spirits and she's her own spirit. And you talk about her as a medicine and you talk about her as a being. And we have that, we can spy that older experience. This is my take. Let me know what you think. In the Rig Veda, we can spy that older experience of here is a substance that is also a collection of beings and so on. And then with a thousand years of development or complexification, it has become something that fits in, in, a, in like a more complex worldview where it is a substance used by priests to get updates from the spirit world. And it's not, these two things aren't counter. We can make the pretty good case perhaps that when you look at the different descriptions of them over a thousand years, we can see even further back, but we can also see uh, the journey of a collection of plant substances, let's say, that looks like the journey of collections of plant substances in other parts of the world from a, from a, 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 a poly being that is both a medicine and, and a being and a god and, and an ancestor uh, to something that's like, here's a potion that's used by wizards to talk to the spirits. Does that, is that like, what do you think to them? Yeah, I think it's, it's this, this deity side is nothing, um, I can't say that it's separate or is something that was built yeah. or mistake, let's say it's a metaphorical mistake, you know, it is specifically because I have tested these, all of these, you know, supplements, you know, to make this, uh, basically the, the formulation for Magi, um, like, I guess some, sometime probably that comes from. I would say, let's say, if I naturally think about how um, we went through, let's say this, about 10,000 years. So I guess there were times that there were less, less people and then more nature and then the con connection with more nature and then smaller group of people. And naturally, you know, let's say this, the, the connection to the outside was more, was bolder than the distraction that today we have with just like communication with humans, you know, or, you know, let's say now it's just a, today's the worst version, which, which is like media and social media, blah, blah. But, but what I also believe, and I've sensed it is that under these potions, or let's say this specifically this, I would say like we get to that, but this dream, dream inducing potion. So you tap into a layer of consciousness that is more collective that is related to a, a, a residue of the fragment of the consciousness of our ancestors and people today, whatever it is that we can describe today. And, but that's a being, that's an understanding from a perspective yeah. of a human, that is something, you know, that is, it's either like, let's say it's a smaller good size of a God that, you know, has its own um, it's like, like deity, you know, that it has its own, uh, you know, let's say characteristic. And you see that that exists in the Zoroastrian pantheon too, right? Like the Mitra or let's say Ahura Mazda, or, you know, that like there's like, are the same in the, in the, uh, in Rig Veda. So they knew these beings and kind of like, there's this non-tangible beings or entities that they were bigger than human. Their consciousness are in a different scale and they had this this tools to access to them or to call them and um yeah it may even today for example like we are working with this plan that iranians they, almost all iranians they they have it in their home it's called a span or syrian rue and we burn it because we believe that we are reverting the evil's eye and to so many it's superstition but everybody is doing that but the real yeah. thing is that Zoroastrians also, they were also, you know, their Derusha is basically another name that they were using for Homa, which is not drinking it, but burning it. And that's exactly for letting the, these entities to go away, the entities that are not invited. So yeah. like being a science, is, scientist yeah. talking about this, this is, um, I would say, unless I really like believe in the step-by-step, -step, you know, conclusion to that. 
I would never have talked today as what I'm referring to this unknowns, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, around here, I'm just going to say things like spirits because I get to. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have to play scientist uh, to do that. But I think this is what you mentioned, the, the use of incense. This is super important because I, I'm sure like you said, well, technically for longer, because I've been dabbling in this field historically for a couple of decades now. And there have been candidates for Soma since the whole um, road to Eleusis thesis came out, which is that broadly speaking, cultures develop uh, on top of psychedelic experiences, that places like Eleusis had an actual substance that would alter people's consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. And the one people have been looking for for a while has been some. Uh, and there's historical reasons for that, the, the British Empire's fascination with its colonies and so on, right? And the top of the list has never been very satisfactory. So the top of the list for the last 40 years, people, the, Syrian Rue's been there, but there's been challenges with its description, which we'll get to in a uh, second, which I think you've frankly solved, which is how it uh, potentiates. So Syrian Rue has been on the short list, but the one that people in this world mostly think about is Amanita muscaria, which it just isn't. And, and one of the reasons it isn't is you don't use mushrooms as incense. Like this is, Soma is used, well, actually, let me know what you think about that. But also what did the Zoroast, what did the Magi use Homa for? Like, cause I think this will help people realize uh, what it is, what the journey that you are on like, and uh, an amazing discovery that you guys have made. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I think we have to put a distinction between Homo Soma. You know, that's, I think this sure. is, and the reason for that is, first of all, like all these 100, 200 years of speculation about Homo Soma, what, what plant was Homo? Like the, Homo was not a plant. Like the Homo was a potion. Homo was an extract. Homo was something that there were, Homo did, even the word means to press out, you know, like you're pressing something out of, a plant or a group of plant. And um, so whatever it was, the, the, the Magi had the formulation or you know, the, some people had the formulation. They knew, let's say, how much of, of, let's say, the plant has to get into the, you know, this pestle and mortar to be pressed out and then washed out and then come out you know, as a potion. This is one thing. The other thing is that um, the reason that they were using Homo Soma, it's, it has different contexts, you know, I, I am not an expert in Soma. I'm mostly looking into the Zoroastrian context. And uh, with the Zoroastrian context, there are, you know, they were taking within the, um, basically within the assembly of priests. So it was never for regular people. It was always for elites, you know, in that, in Iran, Iran at that point was, it had castes, castes of uh, basically priests, castes of warriors and kings, and then castes of, you know, farmers. Even they had their own different fire temple in Iran. There are three different fire temples in Iran that basically people of that, those castes, they were going to their own fire temple. Uh, and so Homa was stayed within the, within the Magi or within the, the priests. And then it was exposed also to others, you know, outside those. For example, there is this story of Zarahustra who exposed uh, who actually brought Homa to Wishtas, which was the king of his time. And then he drank it. It is one of the stories that exists, you know, and is, is documented. And then he had this three days out of body. And then when he wakes up, you know, he follows, you know, the teachings and he supports it as a, um, as a supporter. And then there is another book, which is called the Book of Ardai Wiraz, which is actually it's an 8,000 uh, words book that exists on, on Google. This is kind of like an apocalyptic story about this, this guy who was not a priest, who was just a righteous man, who was a person that was trusted by the community, who was brought into the fire temple of far back in, in close to Fars, which there's nothing left of that. But he actually, he was invited by the Magi, by the priest to basically in representation of the people to go to travel to the other realms, to the realm of after death, to make sure that their teachings or their, their, um, um, their prayers, you know, their theology, you know, practices was, was right. And it's basically to the right God. It's kind of like confirmation of their, uh, of their practice. 
Um, so there are different referrals for why why it was the the reason. But another reason is actually is about um, a, a practice or a ritual, which is called the yasna ritual. So yasna ritual is where they make homa, and then traditionally, but today one, for example, I, I, they're not practicing it in in Iran anymore. I guess I've heard that the last time was 1962. It's like a very long process. Uh, but they're still doing it in India within the Parsi community. But at the end, what they drink is a very different, a very mild potion that comes out of ephedra, basically, uh, which is kind of like a very mild, like a microdose of MDMA, I would say, you know, that's the effect. But but th- those effects, you know, b- b- those assembly was kind of like the two, there were two, um, there were only priest there were two priests that one of them was making a batch from the day before and then the new priest uh was coming to the next day so the new priest was being tested by the other priest when the new priest was going through this journey of afterlife and then kind of like the, the, the truth of that person was coming up through this exposure to to homa so homa basically if you're a righteous person Homa keeps you and you're not going to have any problem. You go through the experience, you come back, no problem. But if you are, you know, pretending or if you are, let's say, if you are not by heart that, um, you know, like you're not to, there to serve, that's kind of like where um, it's, there it becomes like more like a, um, I would say, um, yeah, just a test, you know, just a test of the other priests. So there was an assembly of the six priests that they were, that the new priest was called Raspi. There was Zotar and Raspi. Raspi was basically taking Homa in presence of this assembly while, while they were present. Um, I don't think any of these are happening today, but if whoever is interested in listening to this this podcast, if they look into the Yasna number 9, 10, and 11 of Avesta, the whole thing is about Homa. So it just tells about like how Homa came to basically three generations before Zarahustra and then Zarahustra's mom and dad and then and then it goes all the way and it describes about Homa and um, yeah it's kind of like the the, uh, the main part of um, Avesta but there's yeah, also one amazing. caveat right. here uh, to to mention Gordon and that is that uh, Zoroastrians they believe that and this is also coming from some of the linguists of the uh, the Gothic linguists that Zarahustra at some point actually it seems that this this shamanic and ecstatic practices was a big part of you know Indo Iranians before that, and some of those they were taking basically they were being taken by warriors. For example, warriors they were taking this again another potion. Was it Homa or was it a different formulation of Homa for fury for just like becoming brave, more brave, you know, when they were going for battles? And so at some point, basically Zarahustra comes and you know like like ask for people, basically he revokes the whole thing. He was just, he, he asked people not to overuse Homa. And, and that is how Zoroastrians actually kind of like separate their whole religion they, because they believe that Zarahustra actually asked them to, um, to not use Homa, you know, and Homa basically just like as, um, like some that, that, that is related basically to some, to, uh, to, to priests of Zarahustra. So that is, that's also a very, um, very current narrative of of Zoroastrians and Homa. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> sacraments tend to um, depotentize over time. I mean, if if you look at the 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 communion, if you look at a Christian mass, right? Like, yeah. Whatever idea that began in in weird catacombs in in Rome in the first few centuries AD, it's certainly not that today. So, I, what I love about the textual documents is you have this. A uh, beam of light onto a period of time that indicates a very sophisticated pharmacology, because as you say, it was used by warriors and so on. And within that beam of light, it, it shows one, well, it shows more than that, but it illuminates the likely combination candidate for Homer. But because it does that, you, it, it implies that far more complex pharmacology and consequent like that shamanic survival pharmacology into into indo iranianism but i think i want to get to the effects and because this is the other part of the the magi thesis or project that i think you've absolutely nailed but to just to remind people the word homa means extraction it's it that's so important it's not the name of a plant so you can't or a mushroom 
Like it, it literally means process, like a kind of process, but it means extraction. So you are talking about the sacred substance is a process rather than a thing, uh, which is when you begin to, which is, which invites you to go, okay, cool. Well, we're talking about homilines from an effect perspective because of dreams and so on, but because it's a process, it's like, well, what else is available and what things uh, can combine with that to make something that describes what we understand from the time? And you mentioned ephedra, and the other one that's worth looking at is a form of henbane, right? So when we talk about Homer, we need to understand that it's a recipe rather than a plant. And consequently, and this is the key, I think, to where you guys have cracked, is, well, Instead of picking like this, the Eleusis question, it's like, oh, was it, uh, uh, was it an ergot derivative or was it this? It's, it's like people are looking for one substance, but the word itself <laughs> is literally a process. Yes. And when you get that, it, you, you, it, it opens up and say, okay, well, let's look at what they had available to them and see what we can do from an effects match to the descriptions. And that's where you guys landed. So talk us through that. Yeah, I think the, the whole unlocking part, uh, Gordon, happened through the fact that um, the effect of these compounds or the, eff uh, I would say the, um, maybe the physiological experience around that those moments of epiphanies and revelations has been described. So that is kind of like how we, we went through a screening of, of different, uh, let's say different pharmacology, but this is, this is one, one point. The other point is that I, I've realized, I've learned that because there are, for example, when they're talking about priests, uh, sorry, the, about warriors, um, and that's this, like basically taking it for, uh, let's say for furious, uh, being more furious or, you know, just, um, bravery. Is that the same thing? Or let's say, are some of these uh, subjective experiences that has been described, or do they match, for example, the effect of ephedra or ephedrine at all? They do not. Like if you just go through the text and that actually comes from the proper linguistic research that I'm actually indebted to the work of uh, Martin Schwartz, who is actually a, a scholar in this, in this field. And, and then basically another uh, scholar, American scholar, um, uh, uh, basically David Flattery, who these, there is a book, uh, uh and Harmaline, that they have gone through most of these texts and they have tried to bring out these definitions of the state of the uh, state of minds or the subjective, subjective experiences. It's not only a state of mind and subjective experiences, it's also physiological symptoms. For example, vomiting, diarrhea, or let's say, uh, this dreamy state, for example, the revelation of Zarathustra came in a dreamy state. He wakes up, he's still in this dreamy state. So if you take, if Homa is ephedra, ephedra is basically is reverting uh, sleep. You can't fall asleep. It's like when you take MDMA, you can't fall asleep. It's an amphetamine. So it can't be Homa. So Homa, Homa, and then the other thing is that for example, in another, when, when Zarahustra takes Homa to, or takes this potion to Wishtas, it's not called Homa anymore. It's called Mang. So it's another name, which is, it's another name of another potion. So you see that these priests, they had different formulation. They were adding different additives. Exactly. They were adding, for example, Hembane Mang. Is is the, some people they think that it's coming from bang, which is you know uh, related to um, the Sanskrit word for um, for cannabis. But mang before 12th century in Iran is actually referring to him black hembane, which is an atropine alkaloid group. And then they are kind of like more like on a delirium. They are delirious. They are so they were mixing hembane with homo and then what is what was homo then it's just like basically mang is hembane and homo and then you see that they had different formulation that they were just concocting on different uh, events so when you put everything together then you're able and then when you understand the physiology and neuroscience and also psychology i guess this is kind of like they're a very multidisciplinary thing it's, it, you have to understand on a receptor level, you have to understand the psychological, the subjective state, and you have to understand the, the pharmacology. 
and then and then the story. So these four together, kind of like it solves the problem. That's how actually we we kind of like ended up realizing that we believe that beta carbolines that are coming from uh, Syrian rue that are like harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharmine, harmol, harmolol, harmon, like these group of compounds, they are most of them they are the dream inducing. So there was a component in HOMO which was dream inducing. And so that does that mean that Syrian rue was part of it? Uh, so that is how actually we we went more and more to where I started basically extracting, you know, Syrian rue and then isolating it to different compounds. And then that was how our drug discovery um, journey, you know, we embarked on this drug discovery journey just to define this matrix, uh, matri matrix of different compounds and different doses. And then we tested like through an experimental design. We tested through all of those. And then we realized that, yes, you know, like, that is how we get to more toward that that state of mind. Yeah, I want to talk about the drug discovery pivot to nootropic because uh, my he's retired now, but my father's a psychiatrist, and he did his training at a time where basically it was single molecules or bust, like singular molecular effect or nothing. Not right, much. and uh, we've been arguing politely, but we've been arguing for two decades that um, that world is over. Uh, and, but it's, it's over for us in the sense of, we understand that from a generation of new medicine perspective, we yeah. need to allow for more than one effect or more than one, like molecule <laughs> to be part of a medicine. Yeah. However, the approval structure yeah. around in the West is still very much because we would talk about the use of the early use of MDMA in psychiatry in the early to mid 20th century. And so on. And you said that it, it. It alleviates, same thing with psilocybin, like it will instantly alleviate symptoms of depression. But he says, but the trouble is it also gets you high. Yeah. And so that's that additional effect that allopathic medicine has been seeking on a policy basis to um, avoid for like 70 years, right? Yeah. And so you guys developed this amazing, well, discovered this amazing sacred substance. And you're very familiar with this journey from, okay, well, let's see if this is a medicine. And whilst I believe it is, uh, it can't fit into what is legally required to be a medicine at the moment. Is that, is that a fair description of the, the journey into Magi as nootropics? <laughs> First of all, I'm, I'm really fascinated with, with the, all your knowledge about like direct discovery and all these, you know, like issues is, is, is fascinating. Um, so I want to just, uh, this is very interesting because uh, when we, um, so my, the Ricena is actually coming from the legacy of Avicenna. So an Avicenna is like this, you're oh, cool. looking yeah. to, yeah. So if you look into basically just the whole work that Avicenna has done, like in the past, there was always a mixture. There was always, you know, like even in Iranian traditional, let's say when I was a kid, they were just taking that, okay, this makes, this is like. This is warm. This makes you, let's say, cold. You have to take this with the other one. So there was always something that was balancing for the side effect, you know? And, um, and um, so when we started, when we moved from, in 2020, uh, kind of we moved from, we had all these compounds, we called them API. And then, uh, which is like 99, 99.5% like pure compound, single molecule, as you said. And then we started to recombine them. And then let's say in a way that let's say we were mixing two or three compounds. And then in 2021, on early 2022, we did a lot of you know, clinical studies around the chemistry and the you know, pharmacology and then pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetics, how it works in the body. But exactly we got to this point that there were two caveats. One was that um, none of the investors were interested to invest in something that you can protect. So they liked a small molecule that you go into your lab and then you build a new molecule and then you patent that. And the second thing, as you said, like FDA doesn't like any, any mixing. You know, FDA likes a single molecule to make the problem simple. And then you make this molecule and then these side effects and then you just have to find, you know, how much is the efficacy, if it's, everything is safe, and then what are the side effects. But but the real drugs, you know, and this is the Eastern versus the Western medicine, the real drugs always sits into the mixtures. And so at that point, this is kind of like summer uh, last year, we, 
um, we thought that, okay, do we want to really spend another 10 years trying to raise another, convince and raise another 500 million to just take another molecule, which probably another 50 other companies trying to do that. And our, basically our chance of success was very low. So me and my co-founder, we actually had this, you know, this journey within. And after a month, we came out and we decided that, okay, let's, so we really want to help people today. And what we decided, well, we, we went through like the compound that they were not scheduled in the U.S. And, and they are not scheduled, basically. They are not scheduled three or scheduled one. So beta carbonates, they were not scheduled. So that was where we came out of a, a drug discovery. We are still like, Vicena is a drug discovery company. We're still like testing a lot of things. But instead of like pushing it for an IND and then go to phase one trial, which we probably look into that even in future. For example, if we still have a few formulation that we think that they're going to help people in a different way, but for us to be able to get what we have quickly uh, to market, we actually, that was the time that we launched Magi. So Magi is a direct-to-consumer supplement line of you know, natural supplement based on the legacy of HOMA. So they are psychoactive, but they are not psychedelics. And they are fully legal. So our products are being sold in the market today in the U.S. And um, hopefully will be available globally soon. But they are in some countries, like some of the compounds, they're still like a schedule of three. They may be a schedule of one. So we are cognizant of those. But in the U.S., there is no problem. So that is how actually we landed on launching Magi and then basically coming up with these formulation, which... Again, like even the philosophy around the formulation is 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 a topic that I can extend further. No, oh, wonderful. So let's talk about Stard specifically. I'm I'm really interested in. So on this show, we have a lot of listeners who are extremely competent in. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but astrology has had a serious renaissance in the last twenty years, and that's um, discovery and translation of Arab astrological texts and an awareness of uh, in the world of magic. The Magi and Zoroastrianism is both literally and metaphorically the um, ancestors of a whole bunch of stuff, like getting astrology right, like sacred timing and, and all the rest of it. And I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of listeners to this show who have a competence in that kind of really classic traditional astrology, experimenting and exploring with substances like Stard, because it is that that opening up, that benefit uh, or or support to a process of meditation and inner intuitive inspiration. And it, it just seems like I have no evidence for this yet, but it just seems to me like a, a return to get rather than an experiment, because in a very meaningful sense, the these two things once belong together. <laughs> and I really like the idea of having I know the astrologers who listen to this show who are very good at it, have a daily meditational practice, are interested in self-development in that sense outside of astrology and use astrology to describe it. So I'm really excited to see what uh, people who listen to a show like this can do with a substance that is ultimately part of that same sort of lineage. So, so talk to us about like how people can, how, how start can help, what are, what are its effects? How long does it last? Can I take five of them and drive a tractor? Like what happens? Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I, th I think I would go with uh, maybe a little bit of a mechanistic explanation of what is happening under, under these compounds. So, and what is this dreamy state and what happens under the dreamy state? So when we try to fall asleep or for example, when you sit in meditation for a long time, there is this, there is this kind of like boundary that you sometimes may pass and you kind of like you fall asleep, but you're still awake. So there is this stage, specifically, let's say, if you're listening and want to practice it, like when you want to, let's say, lie down to fall asleep, just dream, just keep reminding yourself that you're still awake, you're still awake, you're still awake. And then there's a point that you don't, you're not conscious anymore. But there might be, sometimes you pass, and this happens in physics, like exactly the, the the, the super critical stage is, is the same stage. Super critical stage is when you pass a phase, but you are still in the previous phase. Basically, you have to, you get to from, let's say, liquid to gas, but you're still liquid, but you're beyond that point. So this is, this is that point. So what is that point? That point is you are still conscious when you're open to unconscious. So that is the dreamy state. 
And then when we fall asleep, there is no track. There is just this sort of whole REM sleep stars. And then our, our basically, if you look into our brain waves, the moment that you fall asleep, our brain waves start to just to go crazy. It's, it's people, they think that may, their, their, their brain sleeps, but their brain is basically just like more active than being, you know, awake and active. So that is the REM sleep. That's where, that's where we, we, we're still processing. We are still there. We, we are, and then we are just, we are there. We are free of, you know, space and time, but we just don't remember because, you know, that's how our physiology is, is managing this. But if you learn and if you practice to be present and then basically just get to that super critical region and then start to remember what is happening and start to practice what is happening. So that is where, you know, that in that dreamy state, basically you get exposed to the realm of unconscious. There is, there is, there is, we are conscious. There are things that in our brain, it's kind of gets, again, a fragment goes, you know, into our memory, becomes a subconscious, becomes our shadow. But there is this whole thing of, that we have no information about. And in our sleep, when we fall asleep, we, we, we are free from, you know, those limitations. So this is the practice. This is what happens. And then let's say with meditation, we get, we try to get our brain to consciously slow down, slow down, slow down. And then basically just for our intuition and for the flow of information to come toward us without we going, you know, after them. So when you do, basically that is, that is the practice of meditation. That's the practice of like open awareness meditation. If you're not, let's say you are trying to just slow down your monkey brain and just be present right now, right here, do nothing. You know? And that's, that's why it's also very difficult for some people to get into the practice of meditation. And it's always there's judgment because our brain wants to go you know, after another thought, after another thought. But, but that is where, you know, in, 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 um, and when you get into the, basically into uh, uh, phenomenology, that the dreamy state is the door to where the reductions happen. And what are the reductions? Reductions are where we are cross-passing consciousness planes. So that's where you get to, let's say, receive awareness in a very big chunk. You know, you're just, that's exactly like the revelation of Zarahus, like, he like he received this omniscient wisdom immediately. He just knows about this. Mm -hmm. Or for example, if you look into it, it's becoming a little bit more on the contemporary side. If you look into uh, Claudio Naranjo's book and the, the experiments that he did on 19 around 60s with the harmony, the injection of harmony, there is a book called The Book of Healing. Um, um, yeah, I guess I'm not sure if I'm uh, bringing the name of the book right, but there is a chapter in that book that is about harmony and collective uh, unconscious. So the, the book is basically that chapter goes through the journey of three of the patients that are being injected one dose of harmaline. And, and then he goes, basically they, it's interesting, like five minutes after the in injection, they have this huge epiphanies. Like they just know that, for example, they were not that character that they wanted to be the whole life. So that awareness that, again, that, big chunk that comes toward you that is where we are after with this with this start so i would say start is kind of like a mini dose to that that understanding of that realization and then we're actually like launching a macro dose in the next in next week there is this biggest psychedelic conference happening in denver by maps that are macro dose is actually a revelation eight <laughs> I love it. Oh uh, yeah. So, um, so, the, but then they have to just approach it very, again, very thoughtfully and very intentionally. They have to just lie down, be present. They get like the body, you know, unlike, for example, psilocybin or DMT or ayahuasca. Like, ayahuasca is a little bit the same, but um, maybe I just add something to that later. But the body gets a little bit numb and then you kind of you feel a little bit sick. It's not like you're active, you can actively think. That is when then you open to receive information and then you can just be that, that witness, that point of witnessing and then just, uh, just processing somehow. So that is kind of like, that is how we brought this formulation around the mindfulness because that's the language of processing mysticism today or at least the secular mysticism if nothing related to divine, let's say. Cool. So for people who... So 
basically I would take it an hour before I wanted to do a meditation session rather than take it in the morning with my NAC and, and, and vitamins and so on, particularly the higher dose that's launching next yeah. week. The, the, the meditation uh, starts, sorry, at the start, we just like, we, we ask for people, basically our, our um, consumer to take it 15 minutes before sitting into meditation. And the effect takes like, kind of, it takes about 15 minutes for you to feel it. The feeling is very mild. And it may last between, let's say, 45 minutes to about 90 minutes. And that is kind of like the optimum time for, for example, somebody who wants to, to meditate deeper. Uh, with the macro dose, you know, somebody was tested that, that was telling me that like that was like getting into the seventh day, the seventh day of a Vipassana practice. So for okay. somebody who has like, these are kind of like a little bit of a uh, scaling, let's say with other practices, but um, that's a little bit more intense in terms of the ex experience. But the start, which is our meditation supplement is very mild and it helps just you to just like go little bit deeper. The word start, the meaning of the start is a Pahlavi word. And it has, again, it's a definition of a, a state of mind, which is it allows your mind to sprawl out to, to broader consciousness. That's exactly what happens. And that's why we brought that name uh, to be put on, on this supplement. Fantastic. So um, I've been looking at it. Obviously, Siri and Rue is a uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So not that we can give medical or any other kind of advice in, in this kind of context, but for people who are experimenting with microdosing, whether it's like L LSD and psilocybin and so on, this will have some kind of effect in combination with that. And it's something to, for people to be aware of, like beneficial effect, but in the sense of this is outside of what is written on the back of the bottle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you are going in that direction, yeah, you are on your own, but be aware that it is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or contains. Yeah. And so uh, it will it will interact with other psychedelics that people may be taking. Yeah, and the psychedelics and also other antidepressants, you know, and anti-anxiety. And um, so I want to add something else, uh, again, for your listeners, that I recommend everyone not to try to use um, um, Syrian root seeds. Because Syrian root seeds, like a, let's say in a lower, uh, let's say dose, it might not be toxic, but it has other alkaloids that are toxic. You know, there are, let's say there are reports of having tremors, you know, like heavy tremors for people who have tried that. And, um, and then, um, yeah, just there are all kinds of, there's a lot of, you know, basically studies in the pharmacology called uh, texts you know about this. So what we do is we are purifying, we're extracting and purifying, and then we're recombining, you know, these compounds uh, in a very certain dose based on the study that we have done, based on all those, you know, physiological and neurophysiological biomarkers. So this was one, one, um, one point to share. The other point is that, so like everybody knows um, like beta carbolines as monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And um, scientifically, you know, it's kind of like they, they, they say that they potentiate your tryptamine experience or whatever that is a serotonin, uh, potentiator, basically serotonin receptor potentiator, because it, it allows, you know, for this, uh, for the serotonin to stay for a longer term between your synaptic cleft. But, uh, we believe that that is just the tip of the iceberg about beta carbines. That's not yes. what makes the effect. The dreamy state comes from another receptor. It's not necessarily due to uh, basically what they do as an inhibitor to your, you know, 5-HT receptors. And um, yeah, I can't I can just like go on a rant on that, but if, if I'm not sure if, they, if you're in the oh, okay. audience are interested, but um, yeah, kind of like my, my understanding, especially from, even from ayahuasca, like ayahuasca, the original ayahuasca what, didn't have the DMT. The original ayahuasca didn't have the chakruna leaves. It was the bark of the Banisteropsis copy, which is again only the, the beta carbolines. So, and just recently last week, there was another paper came out, came coming out from uh, the analysis, the mass spectrometry analysis of a potion that came from ancient Egypt. I'm not sure if you have seen that paper. In that cup, again, they found the remainders of of um, of Syrian root of of a span, 
which as you see, I guess I'm actually I'm realizing that I was in Amazon about like a month months ago and I really just went to just make ayahuasca with Santa Diamond Church and like kind of just uh, breaking you know these uh, the bark and then just hammering the bark and you realize that all these kind of mystical traditions they were kind of somehow related with some level of this dreamy state that the dreamy state is what makes a DMT experience like different from an ayahuasca experience it's not only potentiating their their chakruna leaves DMT it's it's an onerophernic state. It's this dreamy state that's being potentiated with with the DMT experience. So it was not like yeah. these, you know, these shamans, they found this plant and this plant by chance and randomly, and then they, they worked, you know, synergistically. It was the bark in the jungle that they were taking it, and then they started adding other additives, which one of them was DMT, one of them was chakruna leaves. And if you go to Shapibo or, you know, other tribes, they're adding all kinds of different additives to that. So I think like what we want to also, what we are doing also is they're kind of a little bit opening our research toward, you know, the kind of underestimating uh, beta carbonine only as MAOIs. But, um, but again, and scientifically it's, again, MAOIs has, they have, there are, they, like, they should not be taken with, tri with tyramines. So they have to be some type of, uh, um, diets when you're taking it that's why you could take some you know dieta for ayahuasca you know, and other uh, other similar practices i've had vine only uh, in ecuador and i can tell you it's it's more than a potentiator for dmt like the, you're absolutely right about that and funnily enough uh what i said earlier and i appreciate where you guys are from a business perspective and talking about molecules and i'm grateful that work is con continues but when we get to moments like this, where we have to understand that the beta homolines are more than potentiators, I look at it as we have reached the end of what a molecular understanding can do ontologically. So uh, we can, and, and we're sort of stuck in this world where it's like, okay, well, hang on. Actually, Siri and Rue as a plant does these things and, and Kapi as a vine does these things. And for me, obviously, this is a show about magic and astrology and so on. It invites me to sit more in the plant spirit, like the the being that is Syrian Rue and the being that is the ayahuasca vine is is more than one molecule that does one thing that we've observed. <laughs> right? It's like a it's it's a much bigger experience between the two of them. Absolutely. Mm, I am. I am very excited for uh, this project. I can understand why uh, Dr. Mark Plotkin uh, made this connection because you have done something remarkable, honestly. This is, uh, and it's just the beginning of that journey. I, you've definitely, uh, since since making the connection, I've been sitting with the implications of this. I have a question about, presumably you use one of these products, let's just say stuff. On an almost daily basis, like, do you use it with your daily meditations? Have you noticed any long-term effects now that you might be six months into, excluding dietas, but yeah. six months into or so, even a year longer into a regular practice, have you noticed any long-term effects of it? Uh, you mean negative long-term or in general? Like, like positive ones, like, yeah. I can actually get more of that inspiration if I sit down and meditate yeah. without it. Like, is people, we're only now in that world where people have been microdosing say psilocybin for three plus years and they're noticing long-term changes in thinking, um, improved dream recall, that kind of stuff. Have you noticed for yourself using the product, yeah. there have been changes like? Yeah, I would, I, this is, this is a very interesting question. I, I guess the answer to that comes from, again, my observation, and this is a very recent, um, that, uh, you know, travel that I, I went to Brazil and you know, to Santo Daime, and then we kind of spent this two weeks, uh, going to, let's say different tribes, you know, specifically they were Santo Daime, but like not close to Mapia. And they were all like, these are again, um, very young people and also, you know, the elders, but they were all very welcoming and happy and like living in abundance and very intuitive, you know, like they were all smoking Santa Maria, which is weed beside they're take, taking ayahuasca every other week, you know, and for those who are familiar with, you know, Santa Diamond, Santa Diamond is one of the 
And for me, it was, I went, you know, for ayahuasca, but I actually came out to see that there was this religion being built on a very interesting practice. And the interesting practice is kind of like, there's some, basically there, the whole arrangement puts you in a state that there is, the experience is not an individual experience, experience anymore. It's a collective experience. So basically you get, you get into a movement exactly like whirling, but instead of, let's say, turning, you get to this just like basically there's just moving two steps to the right, two steps to the left. And then for six hours when you are on um, on ayahuasca, which most of the people I was thinking, like always think that thought that like I was basically like feel sick on ayahuasca and just throwing up. And um, I was never able to dance, if you call it that. It's not a dance, it's a meditation. But um I guess my observation of them as people who are so giving, so open, you know, happy, living in abundance was, was that, so they are, they, whatever, whatever they have made these indigenous people to, you know, just to read this Portuguese hymn, you know, which is nothing to do with their faces and with the color of their skin is that happiness is that, is that you know, that grace that comes from that practice is that something within them is flowing them to show up mm -hmm. in every ceremony, every other week. There is, you know, there is this physiological and psychological implication that that brings them back. It's not like, like other religion that you have to push you to go to a church or a mosque. They all come and it's not like they're really on an ayahuasca journey. They are part of this machine that is moving and moving for six hours and and for me, the first time it was very challenging. The second time I got, okay, I got, okay, this is it. This is, this is not about my personal experience. This is, I have to be part of this collective. Whatever the implication from a consciousness, a bigger consciousness level it is, 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 is something to still process. But I would say if you take these for a longer term, beside their neuroprotective and neurogenesis, you know, which is the effect of beta carbolines. Um, these are neurophysiological, but what is neuropsychological is actually becoming more, um, uh, you know, intuitive. So you, yeah. you allow to learn to control your mind, to be able to, to connect with everything that is outside and to receive from outside. Intuition is exactly receiving, you know, in, in Farsi, we call it shuhud. It means that like you, you see, you see something. You don't need to read or learn or gain. You, you see it, you see through it, you know? And um, that is what I think that is the effect of this dreamy state that it helps you to get to kind of like a little bit of a higher of yourself in perception from outside. And it's not sensitive. It's not like your, your senses, like tryptamines, your senses also are kind of being stimulated. It's not very sensitive. It's, there's some senses, like for example, your, your, your smelling sense, you know, is getting, you know, more, you feel things, things more, you know, uh, but I would say the intuition and, and the sense of receiving from, from unknown, you know, is what is being potentiated. And um, yeah, and if anybody specifically like with the with the whole hero journey and hero's journey and and um, you know this modeling of the journey that we go that we want to let's say if you want to live a full life we have to get out of this realm of known to the realm of unknown. This is a practice of living with the unknown. It's a practice of knowing that on a on an intentional basis you can surrender your, yourself and then you can just receive and witness and that is a very um that's a very beautiful practice that allows us to fool our uh, in a, our wholeness rather than you know our active self oh, fantastic fantastic final answer there shaheen i think that's that's brilliant for people who want to know more and i am highly confident a lot of people would like to know more they'll be yelling at car radio or wherever they're listening to this now I'll say what's the url <laughs> where can i find out more about shaheen where can i find out more about magic products what you got coming up that kind of thing lay it on us thank you um uh, uh, thank you so much for for asking this question so they can find me like on linkedin if they search my name but the product uh if they want to learn about it it's called the product brand is called magi m-a-g-i 
the URL is ancestralmagi.com, ancestralmagi.com. And um, so the product are not still available outside US. Like we're trying to get it to Europe, you know, maybe in, in fall, like around fall and, you know, elsewhere. But we, we are like this step by step. We just have to make sure that like we kind of like follow the regulatory in every jurisdiction. And currently it's available in the US. If you're anywhere in the US and US islands, like we ship to your, to your address and you can have those. For outside US, please just, uh, follow us on Instagram. It's at sign ancestral magi. At sign ancestral magi. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and uh, you get more information as soon as they're available. You know, we would be happy to uh, to to share those with with a, with a larger audience. And another thing that we want to really add to that, specifically with my own journey around the community part of you know this this the sense of living or this intuitive, you know, more living more intuitively is actually that, that again, building community around these practices, which that's where the rituals come, but that, that, that we would love to get to that, that stage as well, to have more intentional collective experiences that are kind of like a very mini dose. But, um, again, those are coming a little bit later. And if they are a state is staying in connect, connected to us, they're going to learn more about what we are doing. Fantastic. Well. Again, really, really amazing discussion, amazing journey you're on. Thank like, you. you. Thank you for your time and thank you for this fantastic conversation. And people listening to this or indeed watching it, uh, Shaheen gave a fantastic presentation on YouTube, which I watched yesterday in preparation for this call. And it's to do with pre-Zoroastrian Iran and, and a more detail around the journey of, uh, of ancient Homer and so on. And it's really, really good supplementary, supplementary material for our discussion. So you will find that in the show notes, but uh, Shohin, thank you so much. Uh, uh, well done. And I, I'm really excited to see where, where the Magi journey goes. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks so much for all the great work and the great content, like the unique content that you're making. It's just like very rare. And I really love just browsing through your website, just looking into your books and I just like learning from you is also you know, a pleasure for me. Let's stay in touch. And thanks for having me on your, on your podcast. Thank you.